What is the Upskies, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the GX Hockey Cast. We're on episode 79, Cat a Hat, of my little hockey show, where once a week I go through all of the major happenings in the NHL, mainly focusing in on the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Calgary Flames, but I can talk about any of the freaking teams in this league. So what do we got on tap for today? Well... The hammer has fallen in St. Louis. We'll be talking about that. Edmonton Oilers are alive, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be looking into that. A major losing streak has ended this week. And we got some pretty big milestones to talk about as well. So let's just start with the hottest, newest news. And the St. Louis Blues have fired Craig Berube. Now, if you told me that, A year ago, most people would call you crazy because Craig Berube, you know, 2019 Stanley Cup winner with the St. Louis Blues, pretty much one of the major shifting points for that team when he came in. He definitely uh, helped that team get there and has been a a very highly respected coach coming into the St. Louis Blues job and after winning the Stanley Cup, and his job seemed very secure, even during some of the the downs of the St. Louis Blues after their Stanley Cup victory. <clears throat> but the hammer has fallen, ladies and gentlemen, and Craig Berube is out as the head coach of the St. Louis Blues. So what does that mean for the Blues? Well, he is being replaced by Drew Bannister. I cannot say with any confidence that I really know anything about this guy, but... You know, when it comes with coaching changes, you're generally going to have a a good week or so, depending. You're definitely going to have a little bit of insurgence of uh, upgraded play, let's say, when you have a new coach. We look at what Edmonton's going through right now with their new coach. They're on a big winning streak. So St. Louis, season's not done yet. It's still sort of tilting uh, on the fence right now. Definitely was <clears throat> trending towards the wrong way. But there were some things about this team this season that were definitely improvements over last year, especially the goaltending. Jordan Bennington is playing way better, uh, rebounding a lot better than I think a lot of people were expecting. And that's great. The goaltending's been good. The defense has been better than the offense, though. The offense has definitely been a problem with St. Louis especially their power play. Their power play is laughably bad at a current 8.4% in the league. Somehow there's a team worse than them, uh, but 8.4% on the power play just is not going to cut it. And their overall goal scoring, it's not very good either. 2.82 goals per game, 24th in the league. It's, um, I think, I feel like it's come up a little bit since the beginning of the season because Riley Thomas has gotten the season together at the beginning. Very slow start, but has been good lately. And the goaltending, though I said it's been better, it doesn't mean necessarily it's been good. 3.32 goals against per game, 20. Fourth in the league. So everything across the board, even the penalty kill, 78.5%, 20th in the league. That's their highest rated thing. So yes, the St. Louis Blues across the board are not trending towards the playoffs. Um, yeah, man. And uh, yeah, with Barube going down, we'll see if these numbers get better. I mean, you definitely have to get that power play going. I think that is going to be Goal number one right now with this team, you know, uh, with winning, but I think winning will come if you can get that power play to come alive. I don't know what is going on with some of the power plays in the league this year. There are some seriously rough, rough numbers out there. We'll be talking about the Pittsburgh Penguins in a little bit about their power play, but St. Louis, another team that is just cannot score on the power play. And you look at their team, there's definitely some skill on this team up front. You got Robert Thomas, this guy is an absolute stud. 28 games, 27 points, nothing wrong with that. Pavel Bushnevich, really like this player. Loved that addition when they brought him in from New York. I thought that was an awesome addition. 26 games, 21 points, not bad. And then you got Jordan Cairo, who is the exact comparable to Robert Thomas. They signed identical deals, just completely the same deal. And in 28 games, only the 17 points. So 
10 more points on the board for Thomas. Kairou is also a minus 9. Thomas is a plus 6. So you're definitely not getting equal play out of your two uh, biggest, I guess, offensive stars on your team. But, uh, and yeah, so Kairou's been playing better, but only the five goals. You would expect maybe 10 goals out of Kairou and the five out of Thomas, because Thomas is a more uh, prominent at passing, but he's putting up the goals this year, and that's great to see. And then you got Braden Shen, the new guy, Kevin Hayes, 16 points for Shen, 14 points for Hayes. You know, I wasn't expecting a lot from Hayes, but 14 points is in and around were a little under what I was expecting. I was hoping for maybe 50, 55 points. He's trending for a little bit underneath that. So other than that, you're not really getting excellent performances out of anyone else. I mean, you're definitely, you're the big, <sighs> Colton Pareko has been a, 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 a a bone of contention, let's say, with St. Louis Blues fans for some time. I mean, the whole blue line, uh, I think that was a major, uh, just kind of, they fucked that up. The whole blue line thing, uh, losing Petrangelo and keeping other guys, losing uh, Vinny Dunn to the Seattle Kraken in expansion, and then bringing in Falk and bringing in Tori Krug. It just didn't seem like that was the thing. They doubled down on Pareko, which at the time didn't seem like a bad idea he's a young big defenseman looks like the sky is the limit for this young man and then they kind of gave him the role and he hasn't really grown into that role yet so ever since Petrangelo has left the St. Louis Blues I, I don't think they've really been a serious threat in the playoffs or anything like that man Petrangelo was a huge piece for them and and it shows he's gone off to have major success with the Vegas Golden Knights obviously winning a Stanley Cup last year so that is something we got. Casperi Kapanen, you know, definitely was hoping for more out of this player. Uh, thankfully, they didn't have to, like, give up any assets. They claimed him on waivers from the Penguins. And in 28 games, he's only got the three goals, nine points, a minus one. So, yeah, nothing special out of that. And then you have the other new guy, Jacob Verana. I thought it could be a good fit for him. And sadly, it's not. They have placed him on waivers as far as I know of this recording. No one has claimed him. It doesn't seem like someone would claim him with that contract on uh, on the books as well. And in 19 games, only the two goals, six assists, a minus five. So, yeah, not fantastic. And that is, you know, that sucks, man, because I, I was a fan and still am a fan of Arana. I thought there was a lot of promise with this player, but a lot of moving around lately and... Seems like this player is looking for a home. You know, I always look at a team like San Jose right now that could maybe grab a Verona uh, cheap in a trade right now because now that uh, Verona clears waivers, San Jose, let's say, they can throw a sixth round, seventh round pick at the St. Louis Blues and then bring him over and he wouldn't have to clear through waivers because he's already done so. So they could bring him into the organization and see if they can do something with this player. Who knows? Some of their younger players on the team. I mean, Jake Neighbors, he's got a interesting stat line right now. 28 games, the 10 goals, and only the one assist. So doing the Cy Young thing, you know, I, I don't really know anything about baseball, but that's what everyone always says. They have their young defenseman, Perunovic. He hasn't gotten into all the games this season, but has gotten into 17 games. Only the two assists, a minus seven. So not extremely encouraging right there. So yeah, it doesn't look like things have really come together this season for the St. Louis Blues. And um, yeah, with the coaching change, we'll see if that is something that is going to help him out. Goaltending wise, you know, Jordan Binnington off to a great start. Still a pretty good uh, season going for him right now at least uh, compared to the last few seasons. He's had 21 games, 8 wins, 9 losses, 1 in overtime loss as well. 3.10 goals against average and a 9.07 save percentage with the one shutout. So not bad, a, a little around league average, maybe a little bit above right now. But, you know, Jordan Binnington is not the problem on the St. Louis Blues this year, I, I would say. I haven't heard of any... You know, Jordan Bennington throwing fake punches at anybody, getting in anyone's face, exploding. Maybe he's keeping that to a minimum or behind closed doors this season, which has benefited the team, I would say, a little bit anyway, but it hasn't changed the whole team. And then Joel Hofer, Hofer um, 
up and down a little bit. Had some good games, you know, the shutout there. But, uh, yeah, definitely doesn't look like it's going all that good for him. 893 save percentage, not ideal. Got the five wins, five losses, the 319 goals again. So, yeah, the goaltending isn't necessarily um, saving the St. Louis Blues anymore. I think it definitely helped them get some wins early. But that can only last for so long, right? So, with the goal t- with the coaching change, let me know if the St. Louis Blues are going to be able to turn this around. It doesn't look like it. I mean, the West is still kind of opened up, but you're seeing the Edmonton Oilers flying up, and yeah, it's starting to look like the the door is starting to close for the St. Louis Blues, but curious to hear what you guys think about that. And speaking of curious, I I am rather curious to uh, hear what Everyone was thinking about the whole Detroit-Ottawa situation that went down this this week. So, uh, Dylan Larkin, a very scary situation in Ottawa. Uh, there was a scrum in front of the net, and then all of a sudden, Dylan Larkin collapses onto the ice, completely knocked out. So, it looks like someone kind of whacked him in the back of the head. He goes down, he was knocked out, and that's just terrifying like your heart drops immediately when you see something like that it's it's very alarming and obviously the Detroit Red Wings reacted in a very not pleasant way and David Perron being the main culprit out of this situation he attacks Arter Zub I believe it was who wasn't responsible for what happened to Dylan Larkin so sadly Perron the wires crossed he saw red he just absolutely lost it and attack Zub. It's just, it's what happens. You see your best player, your captain on your team go down like that. You probably imagine the worst has happened. Someone, it looked bad in the moment. Everything happens so very, very quickly. We have to remember that. Like, I know everyone got to see it in 20 different camera angles and in slow-mo and everything, but David Perron, in the moment, that's not how it went down in his eyes. It was just like that. Bam, guys on the ice, you're freaking out. What the fuck happened? So, it's a very unfortunate situation. Thankfully, Dylan Larkin was able to get up under his own power, and it seems like uh, the worst didn't happen, thankfully. so. But sadly, Zub did get attacked. It was pretty vicious. Like David Perron just kind of cross-checked him right up onside the head, and it was ugly. And the, the punishment has come down. Six-game suspension for David Perron. And that's, again, kind of trending towards this year, the punishments have been more severe than what is usually expected out of the league. Now, it's very hard to expect or uh, have any idea what the league is going to do with anything. There's really no precedent for anything. It's very random, situational. Uh, is it is it 12 o'clock? Is it 2 p.m. right now? I don't know. Very weird league that we are in, and... But all I can say is that this year, it seems like the punishments have been fairly severe. Now... I don't think that's a problem. I think that's good. You got the new guy in the NHLPA. You got let's just put your foot down. Let's let's make a statement. Let's let's stop this. Let's let's try and uh, be serious about this. So uh, serious situation went down. Six game suspension. That's that's big, man. David Perron. He makes a good amount of money. That is going to be a good dent of money he is going to lose. The NHLPA has appealed uh, the suspension for David Perron now. <clears throat> It's, it's probably going to go down the way that it always does. Uh, Perron, he's more than likely probably 98% going to miss the, the six games. He's not going to play, I would imagine. They're going to appeal it. Gary Bettman will make the decision. He'll wait out the whole entire six games and then more than likely say no. The The main appeal for this is for David Perron to get his money back. Um, it's very doubtful that he's going to be on the ice before uh, the six-game suspension is up. He's already done one game of that suspension as of this recording, so there is that as well. But uh, yeah, it's mostly he's going to want to try and recoup some of that money. If he can get back on the ice, I mean, that would be great. But that would be a straight-up Christmas miracle if uh, Santa Bettman would be you know, very generous, which he usually is not with these kind of things, it's almost guaranteed he's going to sit the whole six games, which sucks because Detroit's kind of struggling right now. So Patrick Kane, last week, he signs with Detroit. Everyone's all excited. Hooray. And that's great. Well, Detroit hasn't really won anything since Patrick Kane has entered the lineup. Now, is that his fault? No, not 100%. I wouldn't say that. Patrick Kane, he scored a nice goal. He looked like Patrick Kane on that goal. Just a nice rip-a-doodle-doo. But 
This is the kind of thing that happens and the risk that you play sometimes when you want to bring in a player late into the season, a player that hasn't played, and coming off of a major hip surgery. It's going to maybe shake up the lineup, shake up the chemistry in a way that you don't want. Maybe players are, you know, calming down a little, like trying to ease it in for Patrick Kane. So they're like trying to play to his pace. I don't know, but... Regardless, the record shows they're they're not winning with Patrick Kane in the lineup right now. So that's not ideal. If they're going to be losing Dylan Larkin for any amount of time, that's not going to help either. And I just looked up, yeah, it looks like Dylan Larkin will be out for at least a week with that upper body injury. So, you know, it's not ideal, obviously, that sucks. And on top of that, JT Confer has been put on injured reserve and he's been a pretty damn good player for them this season I would know he was on my fantasy team and he was doing really well for me and yeah that that takes a hit out of my fantasy team and I would imagine it would take even more of a bite out of the Detroit Red Wings and on top of that I just looked at Patrick Kane's stats he's a minus five and four games as well so you know that's another thing you know Patrick Kane was not coming in with any sort of defensive responsibility it's like oh Patrick Kane's gonna come in and, and rock the penalty kill he's gonna oh he's gonna be so amazing no obviously not they wanted him in there for a little bit of depth some veteran leadership and yeah so far it hasn't worked out uh I'm not trashing on him already I, well, I wasn't expecting him to come in and change the whole world for Detroit overnight I would still give it some time. It's kind of expected that he would be a little bit slow out of the gate. But yeah, again, that's just mostly for the Detroit fans or some of the fans of Patrick Kane that were expecting this guy to come out and get seven points in the first two games for Detroit. It just wasn't going to happen. But could Patrick Kane still provide something for the Detroit Red Wings? Of course, but I don't know. I don't think it's going to be the thing that can get them necessarily into the playoffs as they're still kind of just struggling like across the board their numbers are okay like there's nothing too crazy but yeah Detroit is still plucking away I don't know I don't know if their uh, their chances aren't looking so great right now but you know whose chances are looking pretty good at this time it's the Edmonton Oilers wow these dudes are alive they are on what an eight game winning streak right now and you know, it, it was looking really good at the beginning. They, they do the coaching change. They won three, but then they lost three. And everyone was like, oh, no, the wheels are falling off the bus. And then they come back and they destroy the Washington Capitals 5 nothing, And then off to the races they go. I think in those first two games there, they destroy Washington 5 nothing. They just eviscerate the Ducks 8-2, to two, and I think those were the two games where Connor McDavid had nine points in two games. So that's the kind of thing that Connor McDavid is capable of. It seems like he is fully healthy and Connor McDavid again, and it looks like the Edmonton Oilers... This is the... I don't get this, man. I just don't fucking get this. It's the same team that was on the ice. All of a sudden, you get a coaching change. Bam, you rack off. Eight wins in a row. Stuart Skinner's playing fine all over again. Like, it's so weird. It is so freaking weird, but off they go. 8-2 win against Anaheim. They take down the Vegas Golden Knights 5-4. They take out the Winnipeg Jets 3-1. Those are two of the hotter teams in the West. They deal with... Carolina 6 to 1. No freaking problem. Take out Minnesota who was also on a heater. Take out New Jersey and then they take down Connor Bedard and the Chicago Blackhawks the other night. So they're off and rolling, man. You keep this up, they are absolutely going to be making the playoffs and they've already shot themselves up. They're right behind the Phoenix Arizona Coyotes and the wild card. So they're right back into it and look to be one of the scariest teams in the league right now like Connor McDavid putting up fucking ridiculous amount of points right now he is shooting up the statistic boards and watch yourselves I mean Nikita Kucherov look out you better watch out man JT Miller you're not safe anymore Connor McDavid and the Oilers are back Evander Kane is just dummying people Zach Hyman is putting up a bunch of points Uh, he's been good all year honestly like he's just been there really hasn't been any slump for Zach Hyman this season which is great and yeah Leon's doing his thing the defense is playing better they're definitely not having as many shots going towards Stuart Skinner on a daily basis and he's been solid man like look at the goals against and I th- he's played in all of these wins he got the shutout two goals against four one one three one one that is spectacular he has absolutely turned the season around for himself this is great man like I I 
I, this was a very strange anomaly, the Edmonton Oilers, you know, that people may end up looking back on this as, oh, that was a, whew, a little bit of a sweaty start right there, but it's okay by the looks of it. Now, we might be having a different conversation next week if the Oilers go off and lose, you know, to to the Panthers and the Islanders, they lose three straight. That's, you know, that's not ideal. You don't want them to come back on a losing streak, which can happen when you have a big winning streak, so... You, we got to look out for that because they kind of went through it on their first winning streak when they won three in a row, but then they came back and lost three. You can't be doing that, especially the way that they started. You can't have that. You have to start stacking the wins up. So, you know, I don't think that Edmonton is in much of a risk to go on an eight game losing streak after an eight game winning streak. Uh, the, the Flyers did it, so it's not impossible. They've, it's definitely happened before. But the way that they're playing right now, man, they're, they're doing really well. It's um, it's crazy how this kind of thing can happen. Like, I feel really bad for Woodcroft because, again, I don't think it was his fault. Uh, it was just a really bad timing, uh, terrible time to get off to a bad start like that with so much pressure on the Oilers. And thankfully, it worked. I mean, they've turned it around, but... We'll see how much longer this winning streak can continue. They got some pretty good competition coming up. I mean, Tampa, they're still kind of getting it together. The Panthers have been good. The Islanders, eh. The Jersey, they're still trying to get it going. And then New York, that's going to be a big game for them right there. And then they can get their revenge on the San Jose Sharks at the end of December. So... Fuck, man, the Oilers are on absolute fire. Their little oil change has worked. And let's just see how much further this can go. It's very exciting. Speaking of exciting, let's let's go to the Leaf Talk right now. John Tavares. Put some respect on his name. 1,000 points. He hits the career milestone this week, and he does it in fantastic fashion. So last week, it was kind of already up on the board. Like, oh shit, John Tavares is at 998 points. Monday night, they're playing the Islanders. Can he get two points and hit 1,000 points in the island? You fucking better believe it because he did it, baby. And man, did that feel good. I am so happy I got to watch that game. I mean, oh, that was a fucking excellent moment for him. And, you know, history shows that the Leafs, when they play against the Islanders, they have not done good when uh, when John Tavares has been a, a Maple Leaf. They have not played uh, for John Tavares when it comes to playing the Islanders. I would know that. I was there for their first game the first time. John Tavares played the Islanders at home in Toronto. The Islanders mopped the fucking floor with the Leafs. I paid $400 to watch them lose 5 or 6 nothing. Matty Barzal get a hat trick. Robin Leonard shut us out. And it was the one of the biggest wastes of money of my entire life. And I was beyond pissed off with the way that that team played for John Tavares. The only guy on the ice that night that played for the Leafs was John Tavares. And that is generally how it goes every single night. If... if there's if the whole team takes the night off John Tavares is usually the one guy that is still playing I have so much love for John Tavares been a fan of him all the way back to him playing in the Oshawa Generals and so happy for John to have this night the bench clears they all celebrate with him on the ice and his dad is in the crowd they're on the dad's trip right now and his dad getting emotional in the crowd like oh you just know how important that moment is for John, his family, and he's, I think, only the 98th player in NHL history to hit 1,000 points. That's an incredible achievement. Uh, there's been a lot of NHL players, and only 98 of them have cracked 1,000 points, so congratulations, John Tavares. I am so happy for this guy. I love him. He's having a great season this year as well. Just continues to refine his game and continue going and he just keeps putting up a point per game I don't care if people hate him or they don't if they don't think he's worth the money that he's getting paid I think there are substantially worse contracts out there in the league I think John Tavares has lived up to the contract was it the right move in hindsight maybe not but regardless I am not upset with having John Tavares as a Toronto Maple Leaf I got his jersey I got I got framed pictures of John Tavares in my room I love this guy. He is awesome. He's one of my favorite Leafs. And yeah, what an awesome moment for him. Feeling feeling good. And let's just continue on with the Leaf talk. So what we're not feeling good about is Joseph Wool going down. That 
That was not cool. That was uh, an absolute panic mode for me. The second I saw that, I was like, oh god, oh god, it's all over. This is it for us. But no, it's okay. It's it's okay. We're doing just fine. But Joseph Wall literally having the game of his life against Ottawa. Like, he was making so many freaking saves. It literally... He he hurt himself. He was put he put the Leafs on his back and he was just saving everything. Ten bell save after ten bell save. Probably one of the saves of the year against Tarasenko. Like, oh my goodness. And then he goes down. Oh my god, my heart dropped. My heart stopped working for a moment. I might have died for a second. And then when it came back to, yeah, Joseph Wall, it did not look good. Uh, apparently, it's an ankle injury. It didn't look like it. It looked like everything but an ankle injury, honestly. But okay, I will take it. So they claim it's an ankle injury. Going to be week to week. So we're probably looking at like four weeks right here. That's generally how that goes when they say week to week. And, you know, honestly, don't rush it. Don't rush him back. We don't want him to get seriously hurt. Uh, it's so far, so good with Samsonov and Martin Jones. They're holding down the fort. I mean, you can't really ask for much more out of Samsonov in his first game back in the net. Gets a shutout. Did he have a lot of assistance from the team in front of him? Absolutely, but that's it's a team game. So, yes, you should have support. He only faced the 18 shots, but he saved all 18. So, great start for Sammy. The other game, mm, you know, there's still a lot about Sammy's game that scares the hell out of me. Just watching him play scares me. He's so erratic, but... We know this, right? So, Washington fans, the, the Capitals management, they've, they've said this about Samsonov. It's not a secret that this guy goes hot and cold. Like, when, it, when he goes cold, he goes icy cold. When he's hot, he's one of the best. Like, he's he just on fire. So, right now, I wouldn't say he's on fire, and I wouldn't say that he's necessarily ice cold. I think he's still trying to find his game. And this is the time. This is the time to find it. You know, thankfully, we got Martin Jones. He went into that game where Wall went down. He came in, made some pretty big saves himself, got us the W. And, yeah, he played the game last night against, um, who the fuck did they play last night? The Rangers. And, yeah, he put up, you know, it was a, it was a little bit of a rocky start. And uh, the the. Leafs got off to a phenomenal start. Uh, four goals against uh, Igor Shosturkin in the Rangers building. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was literally just like, are we serious right now? And then, like, the scary comeback starts happening. Thankfully, the Leafs shut it down enough, and Martin Jones gets the win. But that's generally, again, kind of known with Martin Jones. Like, you're not necessarily going to get a stand-on-your-head goaltending performance out of him, but... He can generally get you the win. It may not be pretty, but he can generally get the win. That's what he did for Seattle last year, and it kind of looks like they're missing it. They're missing those 27 wins that Martin Jones got them last year with an under 900 save percentage. I don't get it. I don't know how Martin Jones continues to win games, but has an under 900 save percentage for a consistent, like, five, six years in a row. But I'll take it, man. I'm, I'm not... I'm not comfy with this current tandem for the Leafs with Sammy and Martin Jones, but I'm good with it for three to four weeks. I think it'll we will manage. We will manage. It's going to be okay. But Joseph Wall, man, I mean, watching that game against Ottawa, like you're, you're watching this guy play, like that's that's the kind of goaltender like I want to take into the playoffs. That looks like the kind of guy that can make that big ten bell save when it matters the most and. God, I hope so, man. So get healthy. Joseph Wall, get back in there. And speaking of, uh, well, we got another injury here. John Klingberg, he is having surgery, and he has Dunyan rings for the season. So they've made that official. Uh, they're shutting him down. He's shutting himself down, and probably for the best, man. Like, we saw we saw a steep decline in his play over this last season, and especially over that little Sweden trip that they took, like, he completely just lost it. That plane ride destroyed that man's hips. So he's going to get his hips fixed. I hope for the best for this player, man. Like, I don't like... Like, it's, it's, this is such a common thing in Toronto. We get a defenseman that comes in, and he's going to be the whipping boy. Someone's got to be the whipping boy. We knew there was going to be a new one this season. Jo Justin Hall isn't here anymore, so someone's got to take the cracking of the whip, and it appeared it was John Klingberg. People were relentless on him. My, I mean, I wasn't relentless, but I wasn't happy with the John Klingberg signing myself. Didn't make any sense. Didn't fit. 
too much money. We knew that this player was declining, and yeah, I mean, we got exactly what we expected. Now, you know, thankfully that um, they're able to kind of move off of him without having to trade away assets to someone to try and get rid of the contract. So it kind of worked itself out. Uh, but, you know, it sucks that Klingberg is going to miss the whole entire season. And it really sucks because, like, you know, we think back to the Dallas Stars offering him all that money and him kind of wanting to um, gamble on himself. And, and this is why sometimes players just take the security. Because you fuck around, you get hurt, and all of a sudden you could have been making $7, 8000000 million a year. And now you might be out of the league making nothing. So... You know, hoping for the best for John Klingberg. He can make some sort of comeback. But, yeah, those those days of $8 million, sayonara, son. That I mean, it sucks, but it's the way she goes sometimes. So that is something that has definitely happened. And the overall play of the Toronto Maple Leafs has increased over since we all called them out. You know, the coach called them out, Marner, Matthews. These guys aren't playing up to their contracts. And lately, they have been. I mean, Marner is on a heater. Guy can't stop scoring right now. It's great to see. And he's looking a lot more like Mitchie Marner again. Not this Mitchell Marner. No one likes Mitchell Marner. I want Mitchie Marnes. I want Marnes Barnes back. And he looks like he's back. I mean, you know, he's uh, he's playing with a little bit more fun, a little bit looser. And that's good to see. So he's racking up some points. Austin Matthews back in the goal hunting lead with Brock Besser. He's up to 21 goals now. And last week complained about him. He was stuck at like 14, 15. So he's scoring like crazy right now. He's scoring in consistent games, which is great. That's what I was asking for. Don't give me offensive bursts. Don't fucking score three goals in one game and then go four goals goalless. I would rather you spread out, get one goal in four games straight rather than four goals in one game. Yeah, that's great for that one game, but even when Matthew scores a hat trick, they don't always win. So that's not a guarantee, but it's better to have Marner's Matthew scoring in consistent games together. And the conversation now is like, what is going to be the combination of lines going into the playoffs? Some people are starting to think that Matthews and Willie might be the better combination. And honestly, I've always kind of preferred, like, I know we want Marner and Matthews together, but I've always, you know, I think Marner brings out the best out of John Tavares and William Nylander for something about Willie and Matthews playing together. It makes them, it drives them. It, it seems like Willie, Willie's scoring and Matthews like, hey, hold on now. Like, I'm the goal scoring guy. So it kind of makes him, you know, there's nothing wrong with friendly competition. So you put another goal scorer on that line with him and it's not that Matthews and Willie can't play, like make a good play either. They can send off a very crispy, nice pass. There's no problem with that. I think that line is a little bit more, uh, it's definitely more to handle, I would say. With the Matthews-Marner combination, you kind of know that Marner is going to be looking for Matthews. He's definitely... Like, you're 98% sure he's going to take that pass over the shot. When you have Willie and Matthews, you're like, fuck, both of them have rockets, and they're not scared to shoot. Marner, he has a nice shot, but he's not not so keen on using it. He's much more prone to make the pass. What, I think last night, he had a breakaway, and he made a back pass to Bertuzzi or to, to Tavares or something like that. That's the kind of shit that Marner is more prone to do. So, I, I kind of prefer the Willie... Matthews combo, but curious to hear what y'all think. Do you think it's it's best to keep Matthews Marner together? I'm I'm honestly I'm on the other side. Like I know they want to play together. I just think they play better when they're not together. I, I think it's fine to have them together on the power play. That's fine. Absolutely keep them there. I don't even hate having them together on the penalty kill. Like I think that's one of the scariest penalty kill groups out there. Marner's and Matthews on the penalty kill. Like oh my god, you cannot make a mistake. I would be very very tense if I was on the po power play with Marner's Marner and Matthews watching over me. I'd be very terrified. So. They've been playing better. Callie Yarncroak, shout out my boy Billy. He's been throwing it in my face ever since I, I didn't even, I didn't even say anything that bad about Callie Yarncroak. I was just like, oh, it's just weird that they're giving him a four-year contract. But we all, I was like, yeah, he's a very consistent, good utility player. You can put him anywhere in the lineup. 
He won't be a detriment to that line. He's generally a net positive for anywhere you put him in the lineup. Is he an ideal top six? No, I don't want him in my top six. But if he has to play there for a few games, I'm not pissed about it. But that's not what I want going into the playoffs. But Cal Yarncroke, yeah, absolutely. Been a fantastic little addition for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Max Domi, Maximus Domius continues to put up points. Bertuzzi's playing better. Matthew Nyes continues to get better and better on the forecheck. I mean, he's not taking over the game offensively. Like, I mean, he was doing it a little bit more last year in the playoffs, but that's just not really his role on that line right now. He's kind of playing the bunting Hyman thing where he's just get the fuck in there, mow people down, get create space, and he's doing a pretty fucking good job at it too. So things are coming along a lot better. The back end, though it is kind of damaged right now, I think Legacy's been solid. Benoit's been solid. I haven't hated them. I think they're adding a little bit of snarl to the back end. It's not still what I want, like I said. Like, I still would love to have a six foot five, 235 pound just monster back there that can really push and get people the hell away from the front of the net, clear rebounds, you know, give give visual for the goaltender. I'd love to still have that, but Benoit and Legison have been fine. Connor Timmins continues to just put up points, man. That's all this guy has done as a Toronto Maple Leaf. You put him in the lineup, he's putting up points. Like, that's just what he does. I am a fan of Connor Timmins. Morgan Riley continues, and they have help coming back. Like, Giordano's coming back. Lilligren's coming back. McCabe has been excellent this year. He is really becoming, like, that kind of that muzzin role. Like, he laid that big hit the other night. I went fucking nuts, going crazy, jumping around the house a little bit. I, oh, man, that was nice. And he's chirping in the box. McCabe's been a fucking awesome Leaf this season. He might be... Uh, Beside Morgan Riley, the best defenseman this season. He's been really, really good in the lineup. So, yeah, things are going well with the Toronto Maple Leafs right now. Is everything perfect? No. Uh, You're never going to be going completely perfect. I mean, the power play, uh, they went on a little bit of a dead streak right there, but they did get a goal the other night. So that's encouraging. Uh, Just got to keep that power play going. Try and keep the puck out of your net if they can rally around Samsonov and just try to uh, protect the house, make him look good, get his confidence up. That's going to go a long way for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So things are looking good for the Toronto Maple Leafs, but not so good for the Seattle Kraken, who, I mean, good the other night, but uh, here's the news. They, uh, They won last night, but that is the first time they have won in eight games. So they end an eight game losing streak and I did not know that it was going that badly for the Kraken right now, so take a look at the Kraken, see what's going on. I mean, it has been a drastic uh, drop-off from last year. Last year was a pleasant surprise, and uh, a lot of people were not sold on the Kraken. I was a little bit more sold on them. I'm pretty sure I had them going into the playoffs, but uh, yeah, this year it it really has kind of just fallen apart for them. Philip Grubauer's been terrible. Decord got a shutout last night, which was great. And, uh, you know, you got Vinny Dunn leading the team in scoring, which is great for Vince Dunn, but not ideal to have a defenseman leading your team in goal scoring. You don't generally want that. Now, Oliver Bjorkstrand's done well. Eli Tolvanen has done well, 19 points in 30 games. You got 21 points out of Oliver Bjorkstrand, but... I don't know, man. You're not... I mean, Jared McCann's got 13 goals. That's not bad, but... I'm starting to look at these minuses here on the team. Like, oh my goodness, you got minus 12 from Vinny D. You got minus 12 from Jared McCann. You got a staggering minus 20 from Matty Beneers, who is 1,000% going through a sophomore slump right now. 13 points in 30 games, only four goals, and that really ugly minus 20, which is by far the worst on the team. And, you know, it's a hard job for him. He is more than likely the top-line center on the team, getting the hardest matchups. And, yeah, teams are going to have more of a book on Matty Beneers this year. And, yeah, man, I mean, is it is it 100% Martin Jones that was, like, the the benefactor, the, ch- the, the churning point of the team last year where he was just getting all these wins regardless of save percentage? I mean, I was nervous when they 
when they wanted to put their eggs into the Philip Grubauer basket. Not a good basket filled with holes and uh, just a very unreliable basket. And uh, yeah, it's bit them in the ass. He's been not good. 3.25 goals against, 884 save percentage. The guy's been nothing but fucking disappointing uh, since he got here. And I will not shy away from the fact that I do not like Philip Grubauer. So there's that. And it's, it's you know, I'm going to say it's a little bit satisfying right now seeing that he's not doing well. So there's that. But I like the Kraken. I think they're a fun team. It sucks that it's going like this this season for them. Kaylor Yamamoto, 30 games, 8 points. You know, just hasn't really done a lot for them. Burakoski's only gotten into the 7 games. He... You would definitely be getting more points out of him if he was in the lineup, that's for sure. Brandon Tanev's missed a lot of games, and still nothing really out of Shane Wright. He only got into three games this season so far, no points, so that continues to be like a, a not ideal situation for them. You don't like seeing a high overall draft pick just kind of not really showing off anything whatsoever. Not very encouraging. You know, he might be lighting up down there in the minors, but I don't even hear about that either. So Kraken are really struggling right now. Uh, goals per game, they're struggling. Uh, they're at 20, so 20th, 2.57. Not ideal. Their goals against is also 20th, 3.28. To seven power play 20 percent which is i mean 20 percent power play that that's not bad that's 17th though so uh that's pretty wild um, penalty kill not good either they're pretty much 20th across the board and that's not going to get you anywhere in the nhl this season so maybe this is a turning point point for the kraken but when you have an eight game losing streak on your schedule it's it's going to be really tough for them to dig themselves out of that hole and yeah, that sucks for the Kraken. So what do you think? Uh, the Kraken going to be getting out of that? What, what are we looking at? I don't know. It doesn't look good for the Kraken. But you know who is kind of actually starting to look good for? And this is a shock. The Philadelphia Flyers, ladies and gentlemen. What the hell is going on with this team? They're winning like crazy. This is... This is a surprise, and they have found themselves currently third place in their division. They are tied with the New York Islanders, Washington's behind them, Carolina, New Jersey, and Pittsburgh. I mean, who had this on the bingo card this year, but goddamn, like with the Carolina Hurricanes struggling, we'll talk about that in a little bit. New Jersey is struggling, and Pittsburgh is old. I mean, Philadelphia has found themselves a pretty good opportunity to get in here, even the Islanders have been very inconsistent, playing like a team, a very different team. Their power play is insane all of a sudden, and they're not able to hold leads. So kind of flip-flopping with the Islanders. Washington is an anomaly. They should not be winning, but they are. Carolina should be winning, but they aren't. New Jersey, they're injured, and their goaltending stinks. So there's an opportunity here for the Philadelphia Flyers. So what What is it about the Flyers that is getting this done? Well, you're looking at their goals for, they're eighth in the league, 2.96. They are scoring. They are able to score goals on this team. Goals against, 2.71, eighth in the league. They're stopping pucks. Kata hot. Kata hot is stopping the puck, man, and that's good. I mean, his numbers have always shown he's a good goaltender, just kind of playing on a shitty team for the most part. And then their power play is bad, 11.5%, 27th in the league. So even with a horrible power play, and for, like, I don't get it. They're scoring five on five, no problem, but they, they can't score on the power play. Weird. Penalty kill, fifth in the league, 86.7%. So goaltending defense looks like it's, it's working five on five. They're scoring. If they can just figure out this power play, this team could be a fucking problem. So, we look at the goaltending. Kata, hot. 17 games, 9 wins. He's rocking a 2.42 goals against and a 919 save percentage. So, that is definitely going to help you win some games in this league. He's got a shutout. And you got Samuel Erson, who, I mean, he's getting wins. 5 wins in 10 games, not bad. 2.80 goals against average and an 883 save percentage. So, young goaltender right here, not Excellent numbers, that's for sure. Definitely well uh, under uh, league average right there. has got a shutout. And then there's Cal Peterson. He's gotten to a couple of games this season. Hasn't looked good. Been a little bit better, I guess, over Erson. An 896 save percentage. But, yeah, just, um, I mean, the goaltending, Carter Hot's been really good. But 
not as many wins as you would think, right? I mean, it looks like Arison's just getting the wins, even though not playing amazing. Just the team in front of him has been playing good. So you got Travis Konechny. I would think one of the more underrated, underappreciated players in this league. He's been nothing but fantastic every single season. 28 games, 24 points, 16 goals. Nothing wrong with that. And one of the biggest surprises of the whole entire year, Travis Sanheim. Wow. He's kind of like the Brandon Montour this season. 28 games, he's got 21 points. Like, where the hell did this come from? Like, that is excellent. John Tortorella has absolutely figured this guy out. He is a minus nine, but... I don't know, man. Like, if he keeps putting up points, I mean, a lot of people are going to be happy with that. Sean Couturier returning to the lineup has been a huge addition for the Flyers. All around, great player. Good defensively, good offensively. 21 points in 26 games. Joel Farabee has been strong. Owen Tippett, so happy that... I was, I'm a big fan of Owen Tippett. I don't know why. He's just one of those players that you're just like, I like this guy. I, don't, I can't explain it. Just like him. When he got out of Florida, I was like, oh, cool. He's got an opportunity. And he's been good. Nine goals, 17 points in 28 games. Nothing wrong with that. Cam Atkinson has been solid in his return. Scott Lawton, just a really good flyer right there. Bobby Brink. Cam York's been pretty decent. And Nick Sealer, look at this. 28 games, only 7 assists, young defenseman, but he's a plus 14. That is the highest on the team, man. So he's doing something right over there. And obviously, a lot of credit needs to go to John Tortorella, the head coach. This guy has got this team playing some fucking Tortorella hockey right now. They're blocking shots. They're playing good D. And yeah, man, if they could just figure out that power play, Philadelphia Flyers are making the playoffs. They keep this up. It's it's still wide open, though, man. You got some really big powerhouse teams right behind them. So I'm not going to say it's a guarantee that the Flyers are going to make the playoffs, but... Looking pretty freaking good right now. We look at the wild card situation. They're currently, like I said, in third. They've won four of their last five games. They're 9-4 and 2 on the road. They're 6-6 six, six, and 1 on in on home ice. So if they can clean up that home record a little bit, continue to be a bit of a road road warrior team, Philadelphia can keep winning. So on their heels, so we got 28 games so this is the thing that's not ideal for for the flyers so they got 28 games played washington has 25 so they got three games in hand and they're only two points behind them so washington they haven't been playing great lately they won won only two out of their last five and they're kind of trending down but they're such a weird team right the numbers show that washington shouldn't be here but um they're here so that's you can't really deny that I don't know what the fuck is going on with Carolina. Like, this just could be a nightmare season for them. And if they keep playing this way, they're missing the playoffs. They've lost four of the last five. Rod the Bot is losing his mind over there. We'll talk about Carolina in a moment. But, I mean, there's some big teams back there, but some really big disappointments going on with these teams. And if it continues... The Flyers keep capitalizing on it. They're going to find themselves into a playoff spot. Uh, you got New Jersey, who's, you know, they're getting better and they're getting healthier. And then the Penguins, they're just getting older every single day. So it's not each day that passes and the Penguins don't win more games. It's just getting continuously worse. So, yeah, right now the Flyers are in a pretty nice spot. We'll see how it looks for them in a couple weeks. Maybe Carolina goes on a winning spree, New Jersey gets on a winning spree, and then all of a sudden the Flyers find themselves, you know, fourth, fifth in the wild card. So keep an eye on that, but a very, very interesting team. I can only imagine, I have no idea, what would the Flyers fans be feeling right now? Like, are you like... God damn it, here we go again. You know, Tortorella comes in. He's winning us too many games, and, and we, we shouldn't be this good. We should be, you know, getting some lottery picks. Maybe we should be getting some good young players and starting to fill the cupboards a little bit because it's such a weird team, right? Like, you kind of got these older veterans, but you got some young guys, but you don't have, like, insane young studs coming up. So, I don't know, man. The Flyers are such a weird team. They've always been kind of a weird team in in the playoffs, out of the playoffs, in the playoffs, out of the playoffs. They did that for like 10 years. And yeah, they've been out of the playoffs for a few years, so maybe it's they're they're due for a weird random Philadelphia Flyers run. So curious to hear what y'all think about the Flyers. Are they for real? Right now, man, the numbers say, yeah, they're for real. And if they can figure out a power play, they can be even more for real and a pretty hard team to catch maybe. So keep an eye on the Philadelphia Flyers. They're not dead. But one thing that is dead 
is the Los Angeles Kings road winning streak. It is over at 11 straight road wins. I mean, they're very, very impressive job right there from the Los Angeles Kings. Maybe, arguably, after Edmonton right now, the hottest team in the West. I really like LA. I came into the season quite high on the Kings. I really, really like their team. The big question mark was goaltending. Could it be good enough? And the answer is yes. Talbot has been good enough. Copley, not so much, but... Man, everything's kind of coming up Los Angeles Kings right now. And now I would be a little bit concerned if I was a Kings fan that the Oilers are up and coming. And for, oh, if they meet again in the playoffs, oh, dear me. It's going to be tough for the Kings to take down this Oilers team. Uh, They haven't been able to do it in the past yet. So, yeah, that would be concerning to me as a Kings fan. You know, I would have been raving in the streets Uh, with the way that the Oilers started off the season. It's like, yes, this is our opportunity. If the Oilers miss, the Kings have a have a really good chance of doing something in the playoffs. But Edmonton's on their way back up. But Kings continue to be a very, very strong team this season. Quinton Byfield, man, like people calling this kid a bust up until last year. Look at him go now. Like we saw it, the people that were watching and hearing about Byfield knew that this kid was more than likely going to be breaking out this year. He was playing fantastically uh, in the back half of last year with the Kings. Maybe wasn't putting, like, the points weren't coming, but the play was there. And as long as the play is there, eventually the points are going to come. Those points are coming now for Quentin Byfield, and he is looking like he can crack 65, 75 plus points this season. The sky seems to be the limit for this player, and he's getting bigger. He is like six foot five, 230 pounds. This guy, oh, he could be absolutely dominant in this league very, very soon. So, all those haters of Quentin Byfield. Hopefully they're shutting up right now because the kid is playing awesome, and it's great to see. I, I hate seeing. You know, high end draft picks not make it. Like, I still feel horrible for poor Nolan Patrick, man. Like, so unfortunate. That is terrible. You know, it's it's not over, over, but mm, it's pretty much over. But so good to see Quentin Byfield and the Kings getting it done. This is the kind of stuff you you need to have on a Stanley Cup winning team. You got to have the veterans playing, and then you got to have the young guns that are on those entry-level deals. you got you got to hope you, you can get some bang out of that buck before you start paying them the big bucks. So that's exactly what they're getting out of Quentin Byfield. It appears that the move from center to the wing has been a fantastic move for them. Could he come back to the center position at some point? Yeah, probably. But what's the point when you got Kopitar, Deneau, and Dubois? There is no reason to have this, this guy playing center when you have that grouping of centers no worries have him learning under Kopitar and then one day we'll see Quinton Byfield with a 65% face off percentage so there you go Quinton Byfield is on fire and so are the Kings but they're losing their road winning streak is over and you know what else is over the the road trip of doom for the poor Carolina Hurricanes oh my goodness Rod the Bod is losing his mind in Carolina uh, the the funny little interview that they had with him on the bench. And he's like, wow, I'm surprised we're not losing 50 nothing and stuff like that. The frustration is starting to boil over in Carolina. And, I mean, kind of rightfully so. You look at this team on paper. One of the nastiest looking defensive cores in the league. You got three what appeared to be really good goaltenders back there. You got a pretty tasty looking forward core with a bunch of guys that can score goals. And what the fuck is going on this season, y'all? Like, Carolina just cannot get things going this year. And there were some promising things at the beginning. You know, Kotkaniemi was off to this ridiculous start. And now he has cooled way the fuck off. He is barely scoring at all anymore. Jarvis was off to an insanely hot start. He's cooled off, but still playing pretty decently. He's not, like, completely fallen off. But, jeez, man, I don't know if it's just an abundant, like, too much defense back there is it Brett Burns is just getting too old now is it D'Angelo just is he a toxic thing in the locker room I don't know what the hell is going on with Carolina but this was one of the more guaranteed good teams coming into the season and they are not playing up to their standards right now for sure and they got just more and more bad news with Svechnikov it appears he they say he is going to be missing a good amount of time so not encouraging he's already had a very disappointing season so far filled with injuries just 
filled to the brim with injuries. I think he's only gotten into the 16 games, and he's only got one goal. So not a very Svechnikov-like season for him, but it does appear that he's just dealing with a lot of injury problems. So we look at this team across the board. They're scoring 3.25, which is 18th in the league. Letting in 3.25, which is also 18th. Power play is pretty good at 22%, 13th in the league. And their penalty kill is middle of the pack, 80%, 17th. So, I mean, yeah, definitely underperforming across the board. <clears throat> Maybe their power play is in and around where they were expecting slash hoping. But they can't really get anything going with the goaltending. All three goaltenders have been pretty damn underwhelming. We know Frederick Anderson is dealing with injury, and he may not be returning this year. Kachekov is at an 883, and Ranta at an 860. So they can't buy a save right now. Uh, definitely not up to par. And they're not getting... They're not, like, it's not bad goal scoring. Like, Sebastian Ajo, 25 points in 25 games. There's nothing wrong with that, but... Sebastian Ajo is is capable of more than that, I, I feel anyway, and you know it's not a bad season. I think he's there's nothing wrong with that, but you would want a little bit more. Martin Nachaus has kind of been all over the map this year. He's not playing the way that he was last year defensively, not just not as consistent as he was. Seth Jarvis this year, he's broken out twenty points in twenty eight games. That's good. Tevo Teravainen, you know, nineteen points in twenty eight games. Like there's some good stuff right here like Brady Shea's been good 18 points Jacob Slavin 17 points Michael Bunting has been a good addition for them for the most part uh six goals 11 po- uh, 11 assists 17 points 27 games minus seven but yeah man I, I, the big thing is like the fall off of Brett Burns it's you know five goals in 28 games that's not bad Dmitry Orlov just really hasn't found his way Svechnikov has been just not not good enough. Jordan Stahl hasn't been good enough. Only nine points, a minus 11. Tony D'Angelo has been arguably bad, a minus 10 in 17 games. And yeah, man, like it's just not happening for them right now. And I don't know if they're going to be able to turn it around. Like we've already had Rod the Bod call out the team a couple of times. And we know with that formula, that formula can only work for so long. You can continue to call out the same guys over and over again eventually they're gonna just shrug it off and your message is going to go on deaf ears now is rod the bod's job in danger at this point (sighs) i mean it's the nhl right like fucking woodcroft got fired so i can't say he's a hundred percent safe at this point but you know he's he was coming into this this season one of the best coaches in the league one of the probably the safest ones but the way that it's going right now Something is wrong. Is there a move that they can make? Like, there's definitely something on defense they can do. They have an abundance of defensemen, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens. You you trade away an extra defenseman. The next thing you know, Slavin gets hurt, and then you need that extra defenseman that you just got rid of. So I feel like that's why they're hanging on to guys. But, hey, if you want to trade Brett Pesci to the Leafs, I would love that. But Brett Pesci only... In 20 games, three points. Like, he's not a point-producing defenseman, but minus two as well. Like, I don't know. Things just aren't the same with Carolina this season. Are they going to be able to get out of it? You know, if they don't have Freddie Anderson coming back, it might be a problem. They might have to try and look for a goaltender because an 860 from Antti Ranta and 883 is just not going to cut it. So... There might be there might be something for the Carolina Hurricanes to do in a way of a trade. Uh, I mean, even the goaltending looked like to be one of the more solidified things coming into it. We know about the injury history, but they're like, oh, well, they got this Kachekov guy, like the kind of the ace in the hole, and he hasn't been very good. So there, there's still time for Carolina to turn it around. They're not completely dead, but this is at this point of the season, this is not where I would imagine Carolina was expecting to be in the standings. They're, they they tend to have a good start most of the time. And yeah, this is, this isn't been Carolina's season. Hopefully they can turn it around. I like the team. Big fan of Savechnikov. He's my favorite player on the team. And I'm so upset that he's having the season that he's having right now. And yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to be uh, the season for Andre Svechnikov. I've been waiting every year. I'm like, oh, this is the year he's getting 50. This is the year he's going to just bust out and be ridiculous. 
and it doesn't look like it's going to be this year either. So Hurricanes fans, if you're listening out there, what the hell is going on with this team? What is the solution? What do you what do you what what are you gonna do about it? This is not good. This is not ideal. Something that also is not ideal is the news coming out of Winnipeg Jets that Kyle Connor is going to be missing six to eight weeks, and that is a devastating blow to the Winnipeg Jets offense. Kyle Connor, one of the best goal scorers in the whole entire league, one of the best goal scorers in the league this season as well, and he was going on a tear. He was having a fantastic beginning of the season, and this sucks. This might be, this guy does not get injured. He rarely misses games, so. This is going to be a very big challenge for the Winnipeg Jets uh, to get through this without him. Hoping for big step-ups out of Cole Perfetti, who has gone pretty silent over the last few games here. I would definitely want to uh, get some more points out of him lately. But yeah, man, that is going to be a devastating blow to the Winnipeg Jets. And, well, one piece of good news before we go on to more bad news with with, uh, Winnipeg. Connor Hellebuck hits 250 career wins, so... Congratulations, Connor Hellebuck. That is awesome. But what is not awesome is the San Jose Sharks becoming the league spoilers in the NHL. These guys are just breaking the souls of teams. So they take down the Winnipeg Jets this week. They beat them 2-1. Just, oh, oh. So you're already starting to see that blow with Kyle Connor not being in there. So if Kyle Connor was in that game, almost a guarantee that they would win that. And Kyle Connor probably would have had a couple goals, right? So... San Jose takes out the Winnipeg Jets. They take out the Detroit Red Wings with Patty Kane. I don't know if that was his debut game, but you don't want to have Patty Kane losing to the San Jose Sharks, and they do just that. Uh, One of the bigger disappointments, this one hit me in the feels, was the Islanders losing that game uh, against San Jose, absolutely fucking melting down in the fourth period, or third period, sorry, and the coach. Whoever's the coach of the of the Islanders right now, that little soundbite that I heard of him, he's like, it's a sin. It's an absolute sin to lose that game to the San Jose Sharks. And he ain't wrong, bro. He ain't wrong. Like, that was all but in the bag. I literally checked the score. I think it was like, what, four, four to one or something like that? Four to two, maybe with like eight minutes left. And then, bam, San Jose wins it five to four, sucking the soul out of Sorokin. Like, oh, my God. God, so that sucked ass. They beat the New Jersey Devils. They beat the Capitals. They beat they beat Vancouver. They beat the Blues. They beat Edmonton. Oh man, yeah, they have played spoiler to um, to some teams this year. They beat Vegas. They beat Vegas. Oh, okay. Those I think those are preseason games. But yeah, they after their horrendous start, they're starting to like their role as playing spoiler to some teams. Thomas Hurdle is putting up points like crazy. Some of the younger guys on San Jose are starting to put up some points like Zetterlin. So, yeah, they're still terrible, but I think it's safe to say that they're starting to find their way out of the worst team of all time. It seems like that conversation is over now, and it looks like San Jose Sharks of the 2023-24 season will not be the worst team in NHL history. So congratulations on that. And speaking of congratulations, Alexander Ovechkin. No, he didn't break Gretzky's goal-scoring record just yet, but he did hit 1,500 career points. That is amazing. That is amazing. Sadly, he's still not scoring any goals right now. He's still on pace for like 20, 25 goals if he's lucky this season, which sucks, but... Again, this Capitals team is an anomaly. They Their numbers show that they probably shouldn't be winning, but Charlie Sideburns, another shutout this week, just stealing wins for the San Jose, or not the San Jose Sharks, the Washington Capitals. Are they doing it for Ovi? Probably, but man, Ovi just does not look like Ovi this, this, this season, man. Like, seeing him take that one-timer, his patented one-timer from his patented spot, and the thing didn't even get any elevation like something's wrong is he hurt is is there something like what is this is not normal and like I know he's 38 years old but I don't know man like I didn't see this drastic of a drop for Ovechkin there's still time but with each passing day like that door just is closing and closing I still hope he gets it the Gretzky's record but man it's not looking good right now And we got some more interesting news out of Washington. So there is a new arena complex planned. 
for Alexandria, Virginia. So the rumors are true that Washington is planning to move the team. Now, they're not moving Washington. They're not changing their name to the Virginia Capitals or anything like that. They just want to move to a new building where it's going to be cheaper for them to run an organization. So um, that's pretty much the gist of it. It's not going to be that big of a, of a move, apparently. Now, it's it's probably a big move to some people in the area for sure. I'm absolutely understandable, but they're apparently going to be moving the, what the wizards, their NBA team. So they're going to move them into the same building as well. So I don't know. I don't know if Ovechkin's going to be there for this new complex. If he's going to like retire out in the building that they're playing in right now, but that is in the works for them. So that's rather interesting. Speaking of interesting, the Pittsburgh Penguins power play is rather interesting, and it is shockingly bad considering you got Sidney Crosby, you got Evgeny Malkin, you got Eric Carlson, Chris Letang, Jake Gensel, and it's rocking at a current 11.4% at 28th in the league. And the Pittsburgh Penguins... There's a lot of good statistics on this team. They're sixth in goals for per game. They're sixth in goals against. They got a 10th place penalty kill, but a 28th percent power play. And they're at about NHL 500. They're 12, 12, and 3, currently seventh place in the Metro. Not ideal. But their goaltending is immaculate. Like, what is going on here? Tristan Jari, 917 save percentage. Nadelkovic has a 937 save percentage in five games. And on top of that, Tristan Jari, three shutouts already in 21 games. That's impressive. Magnus Helberg in his three appearances has a 922. What is this? How are the Pittsburgh Penguins not winning? Well, we look at the, the player stats. You got Jake Gensel having a fantastic season. 31 points in 27 games. The Wizards, the Wizard of Cross, Sidney Crosby, 28 points in 27 games. The the age bug has not captured Sidney just yet. Malkin, 23 and 27. Rust, 20 and 22. Eric Carlson, 19 points in 27 games. Not amazing, but not bad. Riley Smith, 15 and 27. Chris Letang, 14 points in 27 games. And then... The the fucking depth scoring completely drops off the map. Next after Chris Letang, you got Lars Eller at eight points. And yeah, you got a lot of very low point totals. You got a lot of games um, missed. You got a lot of guys playing only a couple of games with a not a lot going on. So it appears that depth scoring is a major problem for the Pittsburgh Penguins as well. And... I don't know, man. Like, I'm looking at this team. They should be winning with... with When you're top 10 in goals for and goals against, you should be a good team, but they're not. And a lot of this is... A lot of people are pointing out that, yes, the Penguins are a pretty fucking old team, right? You got Sidney Crosby's over 35. Malkin's over 35. Eric Carlson's close to 35. Riley Smith is 32, coming off of a big playoff run. Chris Letang is up there. He's also had two strokes. So, yeah, there there are some team, some things about this team, obviously. Uh, the speed isn't there. They're definitely getting outmatched in terms of speed against a lot of other teams in the league right now. But this is another team that, like, their numbers and and their standing in the league to me just doesn't make any sense. Like, there's worse power plays out there and teams are doing better. I'm shocked, man. Like, especially with goaltending this freaking good. Like, I was not expecting this good of goaltending, especially out of Nadelkovich and even Tristan Jari. Though Tristan Jari's been a good season, regular season goaltender. He's really fucking good right now. So, I don't know what the hell Kyle Dubas can really do. They're up against the cap. He brought in more old guys to kind of double down on it. Eric Carlson hasn't, like, been incredible. He's only got four power play points. So, obviously, Eric Carlson hasn't fixed the power play. Should they consider giving it back to Chris Letang? Like, I don't know. He's only got one power play point. And it's definitely not cutting it. So, what's going to come down? So, Dubas has come out and said that head coach Mike Sullivan, his job is safe. They're not planning on firing him or anything. Now, take that with a grain of salt. That doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. But um, we'll see where it goes with Pittsburgh, man. Because, like, 
I don't know. I just don't get it. These numbers to me don't add up. Like I, I can tell that they're not getting depth scoring and that's a problem, but you're still sixth in the league at goals, goals four. So I don't know. Something's going to have to change here with, with the Penguins. It's rather the wins are going to start coming or they're just having an extremely unlucky season and it's not going to get better, man. Like it's not going to get better next year. They're another year older and Crosby might just poof. It might just happen just like Ovechkin. It just, it's gone overnight who knows now it's Sidney Crosby but it was also Ovechkin and so we'll see what happens man but this is a really strange team right now and I am rather shocked right now with the numbers it just doesn't add up with Pittsburgh so Pittsburgh fans people that are watching the Penguins on a regular basis what the hell is going on with this team why aren't they winning games Oh, oh, and and the Penguins have also signed uh, Pool Jarvie to a, a PTO. We'll see how that goes. I'm uh, surprised that no one has taken a flyer on Pool Jarvie, like a team like San Jose or something. But hey, it could work. Uh, a high end draft pick, maybe he can find some chemistry with Crosby and stuff. Uh, it's it's not crazy to think that Crosby can can bring out the best out of a player, but we'll see how it goes with them. And we'll finish off with some side news here. So. Columbus Blue Jackets Erica Branson suspended one game for attacking Cousins. Uh, just uh, not a good situation right there. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of people are saying that they probably should have kicked Branson out of that game. I didn't watch that game. I don't know, but that's the kind of stuff that happens. Also, Boone Jenner will be out for six weeks. He fractured his jaw. Minnesota, Brodeen is going to be out long term. That is going to be a nasty blow to the back end of the Minnesota Wild, who are still trying to get themselves out of their funk. They're playing better, but, you know, they're not completely back into it just yet. And I just wanted to shout out my boy, Igor Sharangovich of the Calgary Flames. That boy is starting to score now, baby. So, you know, we talked about it at the beginning of the year. It generally takes a player longer to adjust when they're coming from the east to the west and it looks like maybe that adjustment is starting to come through right now for Igor Sharon Govich guy is scoring at will right now let me just see if I can pull him up and this guy has been scoring Igor Sharon Govich he's got scored in his last three four goals in his last three games so that's nice he scored he's got points in his last four in a row he's starting to put up more minutes now he's playing 20 minutes here 18 20 so he's getting more ice time and he's starting to put up points so that's really good to see for the calgary flames they're not playing good i think they've lost what four of the last five or something so yeah flames aren't doing very well but As to kind of be expected right now, that's kind of the way I want them to go. Like, have the younger new guys playing good, but, you know, still maybe not winning. So that's okay with me. And also, a little note here, the NHL will be offering up a $1 million prize at this year's skill competition. Uh, Another attempt to try and draw some form of interest between fans and the players to... Try and get them engaged with this thing. We'll see how that goes. I'm not interested at all. If they were giving me $1 million to watch it, yeah, I'd be a lot more interested, but I, I'm not really all that interested in that kind of stuff anyway. So there it is. Yeah, I think that's going to be it. I did not expect this episode to be as long. I thought it was, you know, looking at the notes, it looked kind of like a light week, but not so much. So thank you, everybody, so much for listening to me ramble about hockey for over an hour. You're you're a blessing. You're, you're a little treasure if you made it all the way through. Thank you so much. You want to be even more of a treasure? A, a treasure you want to you want to get upgraded to a national treasure hit that like button follow along with the podcast review the podcast all that great stuff hit the like button do what you got to do to help the little guy out and all that great stuff all these episodes get uploaded to the gamer gx youtube channel so if you want to watch them it's over there for you as well that's a great place as well if you want to drop a comment leave a question for the podcast related to hockey wrestling video games or just questions about the podcast i would love to answer your pot your questions live on the podcast that would be a ton of fun i would love to do that or if you just want to keep it private have a private conversation there's an email address or you could just say i don't want to mention on the podcast we can just chat about whatever that would be a lot of fun as well in terms of the other podcast we got going on here the gx plus cast wrestlecast was pretty busy this week we had the nxt deadline pay-per-view you can go back and listen to that and the weekly recap will be up as well and in terms of the gamer cast i am pretty locked up right now i really don't know what episode i want to do pretty sure i'm just gonna do uh 
a list video, and I'll talk about the video game awards, so we'll be doing that. And there's a lot on the docket for the game recast in the upcoming weeks. Want to do a... Uh, Want to do Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, Hogwarts Legacy, and we got the Xyz My Video Game Award Show coming up at the end of the month. Should be, I'll probably start off January or something, I don't know, I haven't looked at the schedule at which day that's going to be, but end of December, early January, we'll be starting off and finishing off Season 2 of the GX Plus cast with the Xyz. So that'll be a ton of fun, I cannot wait to do that show, it's going to be so much fun. And yeah, so again, thank you everybody so much for listening, watching, whatever you do, and we'll be back again soon with more GX Plus Cast.